pleasant duty to very briefly uh, welcome you to SOAS, especially those of you who have traveled here from, from far away um, to uh, enjoy what some people who um, uh, have never experienced an Indian summer would like to call an Indian summer, but actually what you've encountered is a, a very thoroughly English autumn. Um, but we are indoors all day, so that shouldn't bother us too much. We're very happy to, uh, to host this, this conference um, on Cast Out of the Shadows and very grateful to everybody involved, I think far too many to, to mention at this juncture, who have worked so hard to, to make it happen. Um, just to introduce you very briefly to, to SOAS and the, and the South Asia Institute, um, but before I do that, uh, may I do the needful and ask you to do the needful uh, with your mobile phones um, and only use them, please, in, in the breaks um, um, between the sessions. SOAS, as I'm sure many of you know, is a, is a university that focuses exclusively on Asia, Africa, and, and the Middle East. Uh, we have 18 academic departments in three faculties and 4,500 students uh, on campus um, due to arrive uh, very shortly. Um, across, the, across the departments, there are roughly 62 scholars and teachers who focus uh, exclusively on India and South Asia. So our boast is that we have the most extensive and diverse body of academic expertise in the region of any university in the UK. And we have roughly 100 PhD students here also working on uh, South Asian topics. So last year, the school uh, moved to establish uh, the new South Asia Institute, uh, which exists to create uh, a multidisciplinary community um, of SOAS-based South Asia specialists for postgraduate teaching, uh, research, collaborative research, uh, research training, and, and general outreach. Um, and one of the first things we did was to introduce a new two-year master's program in intensive South Asian studies uh, with compulsory language training and a semester at a, an Indian university in the, in the second year. And we're endeavoring to share uh, South Asia expertise at SOAS more widely uh, than we have hitherto uh, and to raise funds for projects, posts and scholarships uh, as we go along. Uh, we've had a few modest successes already in our first year of existence. We also have um, a ridiculously busy um, events program um, and if you are not already on our mailing list please do drop us an email to SSAI at soas.ac.uk. You'll find that on the little brochures that are, are lying around in the reception area. Um, if you would like to receive notices of the various things that go on here, workshops, seminars, talks, film screenings, book launches, and so on. The Institute also um, aims to provide politically neutral space for discussion and debate. Um, and we seek to have an impact on policy and practice, as well as the more purely academic world. And I think today's conference is very much in that vein. Um, the topic of today is no doubt uh, contentious in, in some eyes, um, but despite decades of affirmative action in the Indian public sector, I think most of us will recognize that patterns of dissent-based and caste-based exclusion and equality persist in many spheres. In the South Asia country I know best, which is Nepal, uh, the state has only recently moved to begin to address these kinds of problems. So I must say we must deal with the world as we find it, not as we would wish it to be. Um, and I look forward to a day of very fascinating and informative debate, at which point I will hand over to Professor David Moss, who is the head of our anthropology department here and well known to all of you, I'm sure, um, who will introduce the themes of the day and the, and the program. So, okay. David, over to you. Um, thank, thank you very much, uh, Mike. And welcome to SOAS again um, from me, uh, but particularly on behalf of our collaborators in putting this event on. This is not uh, uh, something that is happening because of SOAS. It's happening because of the organizations that are listed in the inside of the uh, of the brochure and we've had a lot of planning and, and input from everybody. So it is a truly collaborative, um, co collaborative effort. Um, it's an unusual event. It's not an academic conference that uh, you're here for. It's an opportunity uh, for researchers to meet together with 
um, with policymakers, with practitioners, to debate an issue that is of enormous importance today, the, the significance of caste and caste-based uh, discrimination to poverty, inequality and, and, and development. Why this event and why this event now? That's a question I was asked on a radio interview um, a couple of days ago. When everybody is hailing emerging India and its economic power that's supposed to have uplifted and has to some extent millions who face caste oppression, including Dalits uh, or those sometimes labeled untouchables, is caste really in the shadows, I was asked? Should it be brought out? And these are, of course, important questions. To the first, yes, India has made huge progress in reducing poverty in recent years. But the question is, why is it that as fewer Indians remain poor, more and more of those who do remain poor are Dalits or Adivasis, as Barbara Harris-White uh, has, no, has, has said, and we'll hear more from Barbara in a while. Um, why is it, as we'll also hear, that impressive growth has not broken the association of privileged castes with higher status professions and Dalits with manual and casual labour, and that caste inequality is no less in the fastest growing and wealthiest regions of, uh, of the country and region? Why are Dalit entrepreneurs largely restricted to running petty shops, working as dealers and so on, and find it hard to get credit or business premises or gravitate towards the sort of stigmatized sanitation, leather and recycling industries? When uh, a few years ago I began collaborative research on civil society activism and Dalit rights, I met people who insisted on the continuing relevance of caste um, and the inequality of opportunity, the persisting poverty and unemployment and ill health and low education levels and exclusion from services that were interpreted by them uh, and, by, and by groups they worked with and represented as caste discrimination. New research um, seems to be proving them right. Caste remains a continuing and structural cause of impoverishment and key to the unequalizing processes of modern economic growth and development. Caste discrimination is eroded, um, uh, some would argue, by the forces of capitalism, but the evidence doesn't seem to support that, or certainly questions um, that we need to understand, that we need to ask about the processes involved. We'll hear about Hindu theological and other religious theological schemes of caste, but the emphasis here is that caste has always been and is an economic organization. At, um, it, it's part of a changing structure of political economy and not necessarily connected to, uh, to religion. So why is caste in the shadows? Perhaps uh, in some respects caste is less visible and apparent and explicit um, as uh, hierarchical and, and discriminatory forms of practice and interactions than in the past. The forces that, uh, which make discriminatory practices and ritual untouchability less uh, prevalent, although no, be, no means absent, are, are certainly there. Just as there are also forces that, make, um, that reinforce caste in various and often unobserved and ununderstood ways. And that's, again, part of what we're here to discuss and better understand. Understand, that's to say, this paradox that caste and caste discrimination is on the one hand diminishing, on the other hand being reinforced. And how do we understand that, that paradox? Um, Barbara will say uh, in her talk, and others will address this in other ways, that caste has become, in a way, a hidden regulator of the shadow economy, of the shadow state, of the informal processes that constitute the vast majority of the Indian um, and South Asian economies. Caste continues to shape opportunities, and, um, and, and, the, and the social and cultural capital that caste represents, um, the connections, the mutual in, uh, insurance, the... Uh, um, the um, the, the caste-based labor markets, uh, recruitment systems, typing of trading and markets are all things that we'll learn about um, in, today's, uh, in today's presentations and discussions. Um, the purpose then is to gather together researchers, 
and to engage with policymakers and, uh, and those who um, are involved in development programs, programming, thinking about poverty reduction and inequality and the intersectionality of caste and gender, which will be a particular theme that we want to, we want to address. It's an important time to address this question because in many, um, in many cases, development organizations have turned their, are turning their back on the issue of caste, or maybe even turning their back on India as a, a, as a whole, um, which is, of course, um, odd given the, the, the still large concentration of poverty and disadvantage um, in the subcontinent. The purpose, again, of the conference is to encourage engagement, and we have presentations in the morning and then in the afternoon we'll have breakout groups and I hope that everybody has signed up to one of the four breakout groups where we'll have some more in-depth discussion to pick up themes and points that have been made um, in the presentations and an opportunity uh, for people to come express their views, put their questions and pick up some of the more complex and nuanced aspects of this highly complex and difficult question of caste um, and modern economy, caste development, caste uh, discrimination, exclusion, and, and inequality. So we want this to be a thoroughly interactive event. So please um, uh, bring everything that you, all, all your thoughts, all your questions um, to, those, uh, to those discussion groups, and then we'll have an opportunity for feedback and a final panel in the, uh, in the, in the late afternoon before we have our uh, drinks reception in the, uh, uh, at the end of, end of the day. Um, I think that's all I, I need to say by way of welcome. And I want to hand over now to Professor Torat. We're extremely fortunate to have uh, Professor Torat here um, as our um, uh, inaugural uh, speaker. Uh, Professor Torat is the uh, chairman of the Indian Council for Social Science Research, formerly uh, chair of the uh, University Grants Commission of India, and more than anybody else has led the, uh, the discussion, set out the, the intellectual um, uh, landscape, as it were, and been directly active in the policy space that has opened up um, in discussing caste and forms of economic discrimination. So without further um, ado, I'd like to welcome um, Professor Thorat, and um, we're really honored to have you here and hand over to you. Thank you very much indeed. Well, thank you very much, David, for a uh, nice introduction. Well, let me congratulate you and the organizer uh, for bringing the issue of caste as an economic organization and, uh, and its implication for economic growth and economic outcome in terms of income. Uh, this was very necessary because India is facing a, uh, experiencing a high growth rate. And in that context, it is necessary that we raise this issue. Uh, well, without losing time, uh, I want to focus on caste as an economic organization. Does it promote growth and fair economic outcome? Uh, my appreciation for David uh, is because not that people have not written on, on economics of caste system, but I think he brought and the organizer brought this issue up front uh, in a situation which is important. Well, what do I do in another 15 minutes or so? Three issues. What's the nature of economics of caste? Does caste promote growth, efficiency, and fair income distribution? What is the contemporary empirical evidence on its impact on growth, inequality, and poverty? I argue that caste economics neither promote growth nor fair distribution of asset and income. If anything, caste economics hamper economic growth and creates inequality and poverty of high proportion of the population, and therefore it is a dysfunctional in outcome. The rest of the presentation will provide the reason as to why I believe so. Well, let us talk about economics of uh, caste or its economic feature. Now, I would like to discuss this with a theoretically first 
with reference to the original test, Manusmuti. You can take any other test also, but the prime test is Manusmuti. And it is with reference to the original test that you can judge the present situation. Ambedkar dates the composition of Manusmuti somewhere around 800, 185 BC, about 2,200 uh, uh, 2, years ago. And the earliest practice of untouchability and emergence of untouchable as a class or Dalit, we call, is somewhere around 400 AD, 1,615 years ago. Caste as an operative customary law continued till later part of the 18th century when property rights were opened up selectively during the British period. Both caste and untouchability is now legally banned after Indian constitution, uh, by Indian Constitution in 1950. But caste persists as a legacy of the past in many form and sphere. And it is this that is that, that uh, uh, lead us to uh, the concern as to why we should discuss it. Now, the economic feature of the caste system are the following, that it involved division of Hindus into five social groups, loosely defined, namely Brahmin, Kshatriya, Vaishya, Shudra, and Untouchable, or Ati Shudra, with a several subcastes within each of these five castes. Five castes are separated and isolated through the code of endogamy, marriage within the caste. An occupation or property right of each caste are fixed by birth without freedom for a change. That's very important. But the allocation of the occupation or property rights among caste is graded and unequal. Uh, to the Brahmin, it's assigned teaching, performing religious sacrifices and rituals, and receiving gift. To the Kshatriyas, the job of defending people, to the Vaishya, trade, and to Shudra, animal husbandry and agriculture, and to Ati Shudra or Dalit or untouchable, the service to all the caste about them. With respect to education, which is very important, three castes, namely Brahmin and Kshatriya and Vaishya, had a right to education. But Brahmin alone can te could teach and use knowledge as a profession. Two castes, that is Kshatriya and Vaishya, had a right to education without right to teach or take as a profession. Shudra and Untouchable did not have the right to education. This feature was applicable to all women in respect of caste. There, there are two more features I would like to mention. That's the caste provides for a social mechanism of social ostracism, which involves excommunication, social and economic boycott for deviation from the caste code. What is important at the end is that Hindu religious philosophy, moral and ethical, provide justification for the caste, because caste is supposed to be of a divine origin. Therefore, Ambedkar summarized it that economic relations of work, workman to workman is constituted by religion and made secret, eternal, and inviolate. What are the consequences at a theoretical level? That the caste system is not a free order, that's the first thing that we must understand. Economically, it's not a free order, but based on restriction. And I identify a crucial three restrictions. Restriction on occupation or property right, or economic activity outside one caste, restriction on labor and employment outside caste, restriction on formal education, restriction on social and civic right, which I am not discussing, because I am focusing on economic features. So it's an unfree economic system, you see, with a lot of restriction. Now, what are the consequences of this unfree economic system? Uh, it results into three negative impacts. One, that it turned out to be inefficient use, uh, it, uh, inefficient use of capital and labor, disincentive for work and efficiency, and limited scope for creation of scientific knowledge and technology. Let me take the first, that CRAS creates segmented and imperfect markets in so far as it restricts the capital, mobility, and labor. Caste and labor fails to move from low return occupation to high return occupation. Friends, you know that the basic foundation of the economic growth of the mainstream economics is the freedom of mobility. Labor moves from low wage occupation to the high wage occupation. Capital moves from low return profession to the high return profession. But that is what precisely uh, caste system stops. So imperfect and segmented market bring high inefficiency. And the equilibrium that we get is less than what the competitive market would allow the economic outcome will be less, the growth will be less than what you will get in the competitive situation. Now, the, there are the consequences on unemployment, uh, but the, the, my paper is in, uh, discussed in detail and it is put on the website by the organizer. It induces involuntary unemployment for the low caste, because low caste would like to take any occupation, but there are restrictions, so involuntary unemployment. And a voluntary unemployment for the high caste, because they will refuse to take employment, uh, of the occupation which belongs to lower caste, it is below their dignity. Now, efficiency of labor suffer 
as occupation not based on individual choice and preference and training or capacities. Tasks are assigned in advance, selected on the caste status of a parent and not on the basis of quality. So it suffer in terms of efficiency. Efficiency affected as some occupation categorized as impure and polluting with a low status for person engaged in them. So if you take an occupation, your status goes down and it affects your work efficiency. Derive no job satisfaction. In fact, constantly provoke people engage in them, our son, ill will and desire to evade. The scavenging occupation, which reduced the status of a scavenger to a isolated and excluded person, why should he, he or she will have an interest in that occupation? Disassociate intelligence from work with contempt for physical labor and lack of dignity of labor effect incentive to work. There is hardly any dignity of physical labor in Hindu economic system. Consequences, uh, further, reduce supply of quality and skill human resource due to restriction on education on the laboring classes. So it doesn't allow skill to be developed. Uh, formal education only for the studies of Veda in the school. No school for arts and sciences which produce, I'm talking of history and theory, no school for arts and sciences which produce merchant and artisan need. So did not enhance scientific knowledge as much as you should have and technology needed for high productivity. Now let us come to the inequality, consequences on inequality. Occupation or property rights being unequal produce a, a, a inequality in asset ownership, employment and education. It's fairly inequality in, in, impact on inequal, inequality is quite obvious in the caste system because caste system, as a matter of fact, based on the principle of inequality. Inequality is its foundation. It creates three classes, teaching and defense service for Brahmin. These are the job, regular salary, good quality job. But it creates the property owner class, that is the trade, agriculture, animal husbandry, which is with Vaishya and Shudra, respectively. An untouchable laboring class with slave-like relations create massive inequalities. So these are the consequences on inequality. I won't discuss in greater detail. But let us come to the contemporary evidence now. What evidence do we have? The untouchability and caste is, is banned legally. Constitution doesn't recognize the differences of caste and, and untouchability. So in fact, there are two acts which are passed by the Indian government. One is uh, you know, uh, Anti-Untouchability Act of 1955. Another was 1989, modified in 2015, very recently by the present government. And there are affirmative action policy. <coughs> Positive side is that Dalit acquired now uh, access to prohibited economic sphere. They own some land. They are into business. They are into regular salary job. They have access to education. And so there has been a positive improvement because of opening up a property right and education uh, since 1950 and even earlier. But discrimination still pers persists in some sphere, if not all, economic spheres. Continue as a legacy of the past in market and non-market exchange. Discrimination faced by the producer in business in access to input and sale of output in market. I didn't write here, discrimination is faced in labor and employment. Discrimination in non-market institutions, such as education institutions, uh, organization engaged in delivery of health, food, and government program related to food, nutrition, health, and public employment. I am not going to discuss the, uh, the evidence on discrimination because time is the constraint, but in the main lecture which is put on the website, whole in evidence is given how discrimination persists in market and non-market. I am straight away going to the uh, empirical studies which estimate the consequences of discrimination. Because there is a tendency to deny that caste doesn't have an impact and it doesn't affect growth and income distribution. I am giving an evidence of empirical studies by some scholars. First on the farmers. Farmer survey of 2003, median farmer survey. Now it is, another is conducted in 2003, it is not published. The, uh, the study observed that if there is a differences in the productivity and income net income between the scheduled caste farmer and the non-scheduled caste farmer. Some of them may be because of the natural deficiency of input use. But study observed that 36% of observed differences in the net income between scheduled caste higher and the high caste farmer, and 64% of differences between scheduled caste and other back backward caste is accounted by discrimination alone in the input market, factor market, and in the sale of the produce. For the same data, caste inequality account for about 3 to 17 percent of overall net farm income inequality. Discrimination results in income losses to the farmer and to the economy, uh, Ashish Singh. 
Now, in the non-form sector, that is the private entrepreneurs uh, and uh, with the detailed ownership pattern has been studied by Bavara, very interesting catalog and cartography. Now, but her own colleague has produced a wonderful study, Dalit Capital, very recently. It was published in 2015. My institute and I have done some work on the constraint phase by the non-form producers. The following are the constraint. The entry treated with the contempt and hostility. If you want to open up a shop in the village or in urban area, there is an hostility and opposition the, the moment the caste background is known. Unable, unable to rent or buy physical space, look, as a result, locating shop in one caste locality, purchases then mainly confined to one caste customer because high caste would not buy from your shop in villages. Discrimination in hiring of high caste labor. A farmer of low caste required labor. Uh, high caste would not generally prefer to work on the farm of the, uh, or the, uh, or, or, or the low caste. In initial order for business and in the sale of goods, and therefore lower prices, discrimination is faced by the entrepreneurs. Threat to invoke caste identity. Even if you start a business in urban area because your identity is not known, caste is not based on color or race, it is based on the ideology, so you are not, people do not know you are a Dalit or not. But when, when the neighbor, neighbor business person get to know, he will threaten to open the caste identity, which will affect yourself. Difficulties in credit and not having an access to social and caste network, which is very, very important. This is a study by my, my institute and uh, Asim Prakash, uh, who brought out it in 2015, very recently, marvelous book. Now, discrimination account, there are studies now <coughs> on wages. Discrimination account in 2005, about 40%, uh, uh, and in 2012, about 24% wage differential. Wage differential could be because of the uh, skill and productivity, but about 40% in, uh, and 24% uh, is attributed to the discrimination by, by the forward cost in private sector. Discrimination account for a large part of earning differences in regular salary in urban area, with job discrimination being more important than wage discrimination. Wani bought out a book just 15 days before, Wani Barua, marvelous book. Uh, observed that in 1994, at least one third of the average income differences between high caste Hindus and scheduled caste household was due to the unequal treatment of SC, ST, discrimination in market and many other areas. Ten years later, in 2005, significant intergroup disparity in achievement in income and in poverty attributed to social exclusion. Same set of data. This is the National uh, Council of Applied Economics panel data. Now, consequences of inequality, and I'll end, I think, within five minutes. Now, consequences on inequality are obvious. The untouchable did not have right to property. They did not have right to education. And therefore, they remain wage laborer, and it can be very well seen by the contemporary statistic, statistic, despite the fact that property rights were open maybe somewhere up before 150 years or so. In 2012, in rural area, this is national sample survey data, only 22% of SC were self-employed farmers, that, that is, that they own land, as against 45% for higher caste and 42% for other backward caste. About 14% of SC household operate enterprises and business, non-farm, with 19% for higher caste. But in urban area, the difference is larger. In urban area, 31% of SC were private entrepreneurs or engaged in business, as against 41% for higher caste. We have an economic census of private enterprises. Uh, Barbara has based her book on that. In 2005, uh, the share of SC in the total enterprises in the country was only 10%, compared with 42% for higher caste, and about similar or little less than that compared to OBC. Wage, as a result of lack of access to land and non-land asset, wage labor account 55% in case of SC, compared with 22% for higher caste in rural area and 22% for scheduled caste, as against 7% for higher caste in urban area. You can see that they continue to be predominantly a wage laborer. The consequences of past not having access to uh, asset. Higher education, restriction very there on higher education. I'm not giving the school figure. The uh, higher education enrollment rate in 2008 was average for India was 17 percent, but it was 12 for scheduled caste as against 27 for higher caste. Unemployment rate, 7 percent for scheduled caste and 5 percent for higher caste, and there are a lot more disparity if you go by age and educational level. 
If you take now the final outcome, the income and the poverty, uh, if you take income, which is, uh, we take normally the expenditure, monthly per capita expenditure, which is a close substitute of income. Uh, 2012, very recent year, Indian average is 1646 rupees, and you can very easily see as we, the high cost is 2239, and it goes down to 11,123 uh, for the scheduled tribe and slightly better for scheduled caste. The hierarchical nature and the graded cost, uh, characteristic of caste system is very clearly reflected in the monthly per capita expenditure. And that reflects in poverty then. If your income is low, you can't buy food as much as you would like. So poverty in uh, 2012, 12% for higher caste, 25% OBC, other backward caste, 30% for scheduled caste, and 43% for scheduled tribe. Now, all in the average being 23. You can see again the graded inequality, uh, scheduled caste and scheduled tribe being at the lowest of the society. So graded inequality in income and poverty is clear. Let me make final point now. Caste economics hamper economic growth. I have given insufficient empirical evidence. One has to estimate, in fact. We have estimated for uh, FAO that what will be the income loss, loss in farm income on account of discrimination and uh, which result into less access to input, net income is reduced, gross income in farm is reduced. So there is a particular loss to the economy. Uh, so economic, uh, cost economies hamper economic growth and create inequalities and high poverty and low human development for Dalit and similar group and it produce inefficient outcome in terms of uh, economic growth and income distribution. Therefore, policies to provide legal safeguard and market uh, discrimination and affirmative action policy for providing equal access are inevitable to promote growth and reduce poverty in the private sector. The point is that we have an affirmative action policy, very strong affirmative action policy, which is confined to public sector, which account 10% of the total employment in the country. 90% of the employment is in private sector. There is hardly any affirmative action policy there. There is some sort of an affirmative action policy which was accepted in developing 2000. Uh, eight by Dr. Manmohan Singh and the Confederation of Indian Industry, but it is voluntary and self-regulatory. Out of the 9,000 members of the CII, Confederation of Industry, only 800 of them have signed for affirmative action policy, which account only 12% of the total member of CII. So you can see that voluntary and self-regulatory system doesn't work. Well, these are the main points that I wanted to share with you, but in the discussion we can take many more. Thank you very much. So, um, we now have a, an opportunity to um, uh, people to put questions to uh, Professor Thorat and to have some engagement discussions. So, um, if we could have hands for um, anybody who'd like to... Sorry? Oh, yes, I should, I should mention uh, that the, the um, uh, sessions are being recorded and uh, obviously we will be editing these and, um, and, and making some of these available publicly. So um, just to inform people that uh, this is a recorded event. Um, so questions, um, queries or, or points? We have a question over there. Um, maybe we should take a couple if, if there is anybody else with a question waiting. Nope. Okay, well, we'll start with this question here. Do you want to just respond to that briefly while people collect their okay. uh, further questions? Um, the affirmative action policy in India, uh, what is uh, popularly known as the reservation policy, is in, the, is in three areas. One is in politics, uh, that of the total member of the parliament, about 15 persons are from the sh scheduled caste and 8 percent from scheduled tribe, fixed uh, number. Second is the government employment in proportion to population. Third is the 
uh, reservation uh, and quotas in the educational institution, government educational institutions. Uh, these are the three prime areas, but in the, as you rightly said, that are there other efforts, uh, efforts on the other areas? Yes, indeed, but there are informal policies. They are not legally binding. For example, uh, there, is a, there is a corporation for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe which provide capital and loan uh, to set up the private enterprises. Housing, uh, in all public housing, uh, there is a definite quota for the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. Uh, there are several other areas. Uh, the, the, we have an economic plan. Uh, there is a special component plan for scheduled caste and scheduled tribe that out of the 100 pounds that you spend on in the five-year period, 16 pounds and 8 pounds must be spent on scheduled caste and scheduled tribe. In some states it is made legal now, there is an act. So, and that includes expenditure on the civic amenities like water, road, sanitation in the localities of the scheduled caste, because their localities are away from the high caste. So often road doesn't go, electricity wire doesn't go there. Tap water remain in the high caste locality. So special component plan was created that this facility should be provided in the localities. So I think in an informal way, uh, the affirmative action policy address many spheres where they are, they are they are lacking. Uh, so uh, that, that is uh, what uh, the government of India did, but in many, in many areas it is, it is expanded. I think I would submit that for female particularly, uh, we have an informal affirmative action policy which is very strong. Um, I'm going to take a, a question at the back. Okay, uh, I think it's a very interesting question. As I said, that the affirmative action policy is not applicable to the private sector in legal term. In voluntary and self-regulatory form, it has come in 2008, and I have told you uh, its uh, level of acceptance. But uh, as far as the laws are concerned, we can begin with the Constitution, and con when Constitution say that it uh, ensured equal status, opportunity and facility, irrespective of caste, creed, gender, ethnicity, religion. So to that extent, constitution, at least in law and at least in promises, uh, guarantee the uh, citizens and also put an obligation on the state to pass laws uh, to ensure it. That is one level, which is more arching provision, under which then we have two laws, the anti untouchability Act, which was passed in 1955, we must say, I must say that the untouchability is banned in the Constitution is, is, itself. Uh, it's a very important provision. But the Act was passed in 1955, called Anti-Untouchability Act, which was renamed as a, 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 a Protection of Civil Rights Act later on in 1989. Now this Act provides an equal access to, uh, to the scheduled caste to the several public sphere. It does talk about private, but private is not strictly speaking covered, but public sphere. It also talks about discrimination in employment. It talks about discrimination in business in a very, very subtle manner, not very, 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 very clearly. Therefore, to that extent, there is no clear clarity and there is no separate law of discrimination in employment, discrimination in businesses, discrimination in many other areas for the private sector as such. And that is why there is a demand that there has to be an affirmative action policy for private sector, but legally, Dalit demanded legal policy with private sector did not accept, so finally midway through uh, the middle ground water choose, that is voluntary and affirmative action policy. There is another act called a Prevention of Atrocity Act. Uh, because the, the discrimination so widespread and so, uh, so much exists on a day-to-day -day basis and it takes various forms, verbal abuse, physical abuse, and therefore 
Anti-Intouchability Act was not adequate enough and therefore government brought another act in 1989 and it called prevention of atrocities in a way violence against the scheduled caste by the high caste. And 23 behavior of the high caste are considered to be atrocious and are subject to punishment. And they, they include uh, all social sphere, but there is hardly any reference to the private sector. So I must say that we don't have a clear uh, legislation or law uh, for d discrimination in employment and in the uh, entrepreneurs and in the business uh, as such and we, we need that. Although there are loose provisions under which you can take a protection but I have not seen a single case in last 60 years by the Dalit who went to the court because they were discriminated in employment. So I think and 90 percent of the employment is in private sector so that is why uh, there, is a, there is an issue when in early 90s we brought in a uh, new policy of privatization as a result the sphere for which the reservation is applicable got reduced subst substantially the lead demanded reservation in private sector that was the reason but i think uh, uh, as far as uh, clear cut answer to your question is that there is no clear legal provision thank you very much can i ask those who've put their hands up with questions to hold their questions and bring them in at a later point in the discussion because I want us to try and uh, keep the schedule, and I want to set an example as a chair for other chairs to follow, um, and to, um, to try our very best to keep to, to schedule. So, so we now move on to um, the next session, with, uh, um, and Mina Varma is going to be chairing, and uh, we have a presentation from Professor Ashwini Deshpande, um, then Professor Barbara Harris-White, and then Dr. Ramesh Nathan. So if the speakers would kindly uh, come up or, or maybe be near the vicinity if you want to see the presentations that are going before, I'll hand over. Um, is Mina here? Yeah. Thank you very much. David, I should go down. Uh, yes, then you'll be able to see more of the yeah. presentations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Well, good morning everyone. Welcome to the first plenary session of this conference, which is cast in today's world. Um, my panel has the dubious honour of um, having to follow that excellent keynote presentation, um, but I know, having read through all their biographies and knowing them personally, they're more than up to the challenge. Um, but firstly, my name is Mina Varma. I'm the director of the Dalit Solidarity Network and one of the co-organisers of this conference. Um, DSN UK is part of an international campaign to end uh, caste discrimination worldwide. We're part of the International Dalit Solidarity Network, um, and um, that, that organisation leads on lobbying and advocacy campaigns, both at the UN and the EU. Please do take some time, if you, if you can, during the breaks to have a word with Ricky, who's the Executive Director of the International Dalit Solidarity Network, find out more about their work. Um, DSN also um, is one of the leading UK organisations um, in the campaign to end caste discrimination. And we do it by lobbying the UK Parliament, both at home and abroad, to address, address discrimination against Dalits, both at home and abroad. Because in the UK, we are so close and yet so very far still from having equality legislation implemented to address caste discrimination, which is, um, has been researched and very evident here in the UK as well. Lastly, um, DSN is um, a member of the Ethical Trading Initiative, and in that particular capacity, we address caste discrimination in supply chains specifically throughout India. Um, and we do have a very successful program which is addressing the issue of Samangali, which is the forced labor of young girls in the textile mills um, throughout um, Tamil Nadu. So on to my speakers. Um, first off, we have Ashwini Deshpande. She is um, a professor of economics at the Delhi School of Economics at the University of Delhi in India. 
Um, her, her PhD and early publications have been on the international debt crisis of the 1980s, also on the aspects of the Chinese economy. Subsequently, she has been working on the economics of discrimination and affirmative action issues with a focus on gender, caste and gender in India. She has published extensively in leading scholarly journals and is the author of Grammar of Caste, Economic Discrimination in Contemporary India and Affirmative Action in India. She has also received the Exim Bank Award for Outstanding Dissertation, now called the IERA Award in 1994, and the 2007 VKRV Rao Award for Indian Economists under 45. Ashwini's presentation analyzes the contemporary nature of caste disparities and discrimination in various spheres of the Indian economy. Ashwini, I'm going to introduce all the speakers and then... Um, my second speaker is Barbara Harris-White. Barbara drove from Cambridge to New Delhi in 1969 to climb the, in the Himalayas and has been re researching and teaching India's political economy ever since. Her fields are twofold. First, the rural and informal capitalist economy. Her latest book is Middle India and Urban Rural Development, Four Decades of Change. And second, the deprivation of victims of capitalist transformation. After the pro latest research after the project on Dalits and Adivasis in the business economy that she will talk about, which is about the social relations of waste in India and the fastest growing waste, the fastest growing waste producer in the world. She is Emeritus Professor of Development Studies at Oxford and was founder director of the MPhil in Development Studies 1996 and the world's first Masters in Contemporary India 2008. Barbara will present on the regional patterns of entry of Dalits and Adivasis into the Indian economy as owners of firms and how difficult it is to explain why the different sectors of the economy make different spatial patterns or geographical regions. Finally, we will hear from Dr. Ramesh Nathan, who has been a Dalit human rights activist and organizer for the past three decades. Hailing from Tamil Nadu, he has successfully mobilized Dalits and led campaigns for their housing rights, education, political representation, and access to justice. In the past six years, Ramesh has played a key role in mobilizing more than 600 Dalit and Adivasi civil society organizations under the banner of the National Coalition for Strengthening SCs and STs Prevention of Atrocities Act. He is the convener of this nationwide platform. Presently, he is the General Secretary of the National Dalit Movement for Justice under the National Campaign for Dalit Human Rights. The primary focus is on ensuring justice for Dalit and Adivasi communities through legal interventions, through a network of Dalit human, human activists taking forward the caravan of Dalit movements to deepen democracy and challenge impunity at multiple levels. Numerous and new forms of caste-based atrocities have been identified in contemporary India as perpetrated in both rural and urban regions. These forms are, wide, are widespread and systemic in nature. Ramesh will talk to us about the changing nature and context of atrocities on Dalits and why we need to rethink our solidarity strategies. I'm going to ask each speaker to try and stick to 10 minutes. Uh, will it be a little bit flexible? Not too much. Uh, there will be um, plenty of time at the end of all the presentations for audience, partic uh, audience participation. So I'll take all comments and questions after the speakers have presented. So without further ado, Ashwini, please. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, David, for inviting me uh, to this very important uh, event. And it's a privilege for me to share the floor with so many distinguished scholars uh, and uh, practitioners on this uh, question. So I'm going to try my best to stick to 10 minutes. Um, so uh, the, the context is well known. Uh, and I, what I want to explore in this presentation is uh, how the contemporary nature of uh, economic inequalities within the caste system, how that is changing. So one view that one hears a lot uh, in the academia and uh, uh, also uh, in, in, with, from journalists is that the, the caste system, uh, of course, is a very old system that exists and you see inequalities by caste, but they are primarily a hangover of the past. So the basic argument is that it's an old and dying system. So yes, you do see inequalities presently, but these are basically a hangover of what inequalities existed as a result of the persistent, uh, as a result of the persistent um, 
uh, discrimination and barriers that were uh, explained uh, earlier by Professor Thorath in the keynote address. So, for example, one uh, argument has been that there's been rapid, rapid economic growth and expansion of the middle class. There have been new opportunities for individual mobility and a further loosening of the association between caste and occupation. Uh, it has also been argued that on the whole, caste consciousness in India is dying down. Uh, some uh, academics have argued that what you have today is uh, not necessarily a dying down of caste consciousness, but what you have is an assertion of caste identity that is not hierarchical. So these are uh, individual castes asserting their own versions of hierarchy. So you don't see the old style hierarchy being articulated in India today. It's all about which caste uh, asserts its presence um, and dominance uh, at, at what, what point in time. And all you have is a contestation between alternative visions of hierarchy. So you don't really have that old fashioned uh, way of um, uh, 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 hierarchies that you saw earlier. Uh, the most recent um, turmoil in India on the question of reservations, uh, which has been very much in the news, has, has been the ag agitation by a caste group that has actually been very wealthy in Gujarat. And uh, the interesting thing is that this is, this is a caste group that actually opposed the system of affirmative action or reservations in the 1985 anti-reservation riots in Gujarat. Uh, so this question was raised yesterday in the event at the UCL. So these were uh, agricultural, fairly low, uh, not Dalits, but fairly low uh, agricultural caste kandis. Uh, several of them migrated to East Africa, became wealthy, and acquired a name called Patidar, which is a kind of a gentrified name. Uh, and today, in 2015, have, uh, are on the streets uh, demanding quotas, uh, the very instrument that they had opposed 20 years earlier. Right? And so the question is, why, is why, why do we see this phenomenon? I'm not going to talk today about the Patel agitation because that is a very specific instance and we can take, talk about that during the question and answers. But the question that we need to, uh, that this episode raises uh, for us is that could it be that the, of course, the fa famous Gujarat model of uh, growth uh, and more widely the Indian model of growth, could it be that it is actually not inclusive uh, such that even the traditionally, or not traditionally perhaps uh, if you go back 200 years, but traditionally if you certainly go back the last 50 or 60 years, uh, wealthy communities and wealthy caste groups also have seen a differentiation within them that they feel the need to articulate a demand for reservations or quotas. And if a wealthy caste group, an overall wealthy caste group such as Patel's is demanding quotas, what do we make about, what can we say about the economic, uh, um, uh, um, the economic disparities between the topmost caste groups and the bottommost, who are the Dalits? So if Patels or a section of the Patels feels left out and uh, not included, what do you say about the traditionally marginalized communities such as um, um, uh, the, the scheduled castes and tribes? So I have been working with large-scale data sets, and I believe that we really need uh, an evidence-based assessment to uh, look at the contemporary nature of caste disparities. And uh, for example, the government of India uh, uh, conducted a socioeconomic caste census, but they're not releasing the data on the caste disparities. But this would have been a time when that data actually could have been quite helpful for us to look at uh, what the nature of disparities between Patels and other higher caste groups within Gujarat are, not to mention the g gaps between Dalits and, and upper caste. But the point that the Patel agitation highlights is actually a greater need to focus, or focus on evidence-based assessments of caste inequalities. It's not a question of you know, your, your view versus mine. It's a question of what the data are telling us. And that's some of, the, some of that um, uh, is some, uh, you know, some of that evidence is what I'm going to talk about in today's presentation. Now, a lot of the uh, debate about the continuing relevance of caste in modern India has to do about the degree of change and about whether caste and occupation are still as aligned as they used to be when the caste system, in the early stages of the caste system. And the disassociation or the association 
between caste and occupation is seen as a measure of the degree of change within the caste system. And those who believe that the caste system is dying down or is no longer relevant basically argue that caste is no longer a predictor of occupation in contemporary India today. And uh, that's why we, we, they argue that caste is not a relevant uh, system, to, uh, relevant lens to look at economic disparities today. So my uh, uh, response to that argument is, is twofold. One, if we look at the traditional caste-based occupations uh, that exist, that sur have survived economic change and that exist in contemporary India, who performs them now? Are these performed by the same groups that to which they were allocated from the beginning of the caste system, or have these changed? Secondly, if you look at the modern occupations that do not have a natural caste counterpart, are these allocated purely on the basis of merit or ability? Uh, in other words, do we not see any overlaps between caste and status or caste and privilege? Is it, not the, is it or is it not? That, that's something that evidence will tell us. Is it or is it not the case that the better paying, more prestigious, modern jobs uh, are disproportionately occupied by the upper castes and the worse paying, uh, um, um, less prestigious, modern jobs are disproportionately occupied by the Dalits and Adivasis? If that is the case, then even though in the traditional sense we don't see a, 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 a strict association between caste and, and uh, occupation. And in a way, that should be trivial because the modern occupational spectrum has, is continuously evolving. New and newer types of jobs are coming up, uh, which don't directly have a caste counterpart. There was never a caste of nuclear scientists. There was never a caste of graphic web designers, right? So, uh, so the point is that if you take it in a very trivial sense, yes, of course, the association between caste and occupation has broken down. But that's not the right way to look at it. We, what, we, what we need to do is to map the modern occupational spectrum with which caste groups uh, perform which kinds of jobs in the modern occupational spectrum. That's the right way to answer this question and not just look at a trivial dissociation between caste and occupation. Uh, so, uh, you know, of course, one can talk a lot about that, but I'm going to try to be brief. Uh, so in one of my uh, recent studies uh, with uh, co-author Rajesh Ramachandran, what we uh, did was we looked at NSS data, national sample uh, sur survey data, for two, um, time, two periods in time, separated by a decade, um, and looked at three large groups, the scheduled caste and scheduled tribes, uh, the other backward classes, and others, which is uh, the non-SC, ST, OBC category. Now, uh, as you perhaps know that uh, in the large-scale macro data, these are the categories that one has to work with. You don't have uh, data by Jati yet, so these are the large groups that one has to work with. Uh, and we have to understand that these are omnibus categories containing within themselves a great deal of heterogeneity. So they actually mask a lot of heterogeneity within themselves. Okay? But the advantage of these large omnibus categories is that comparison across categories becomes simple. But the implication of the fact that these are heterogeneous categories is the following, that if you could, if we could isolate the bottommost Dalits from within the scheduled caste category, and for example, the Brahmins in the, in the others category, the actual gap would be larger than what the gap that we see with these omnibus categories. Because the others categories includes not only the topmost end of the upper castes, but also castes that are fairly lower it's just that they don't happen to be administratively categorized as either scheduled castes, scheduled tribes, or other backward classes. Because this cat group others is a basically uh, residual heterogeneous, uh, that's everybody else. That's the category, that's, that's the others. So if we could isolate the top end of the others, we would be able to see the full extent of disparity which we, uh, which we can't see uh, when these are heterogeneous categories. And what we did was we looked at uh, we divided these groups by the year of birth into birth cohorts, and we tried to do what in uh, technical terms is called difference in differences, which is basically looked at older cohorts of these three, three uh, groups and younger cohorts of these three groups, and try to see whether the gaps between the younger cohorts and the older cohorts are increasing or decreasing. So if the gaps between the younger cohorts of these three large groups are larger 
than the gaps between the older cohorts of these three large groups. Then there is divergence. The groups are moving further away. Disparities are widening. Okay? Uh, and since I am um, running out of time, basically what we find is, for example, in the white collar jobs, we find that there is divergence uh, between um, uh, OBCs and others for uh, the older cohorts, but when you come to the youngest OBCs and the youngest others, you actually see them converging together, but we don't see this convergence between scheduled caste, scheduled tribes, and others, which means that for all this talk of economic growth and new kinds of occupations, avenues for mobility, etc., we don't actually find a convergence between um, uh, caste groups in major economic dimensions. Uh, we uh, have also estimated a labor market discrimination. I will skip this slide because Professor Thorath already talked about this. Uh, there are other kinds of evidence which look at Professor Thorath himself has done a study of sending identical resumes with different last names and trying to see uh, employer hidden, uh, you know, uh, employer discrimination uh, through that. I have done a study of college to work uh, which looks at the kind of uh, uh, discriminatory tendencies that employers have in the urban formal sector Indian labor markets. So these are not traditional rural jobs where employers are kind of uh, motivated by some sort of primitive caste consciousness. These are very, very much in the, in the formal sector uh, modern um, jobs. And this is actually not surprising because in the private sector we find that uh, the role of networks, informal and personalized recruitment, uh, who you know is often more important and, than what you know. And Dalits and uh, the Adivasis are severely disadvantaged in this, um, in this regard. Uh, I'm, again, not spend a whole lot of time to talk about self-employment because I know Barbara is going to talk about businesses, but I actually have uh, two papers recently looking at uh, small businesses uh, by Dalits, uh, Adivasis, and everybody else. Um, and I directly address the question which has been actually gaining uh, prominence in India, which is on the question of Dalit capitalism and whether that can be a panacea, you know, a, a kind of a solution uh, to end a caste inequality uh, because the, we have an organization in India called the Dalit Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry who believe that uh, Dalit should uh, become capitalists and uh, be job givers and not job seekers, not rely on the government to give, uh, take jobs through quotas. This will help them to rise to the top of the social pyramid and end the caste system. Uh, the broad evidence on this is that uh, while there is a group of Dalit millionaires that's emerged and that's, their success is actually quite striking given all the odds that they've had to overcome in order to establish their businesses, the large part of Dalit businesses is not in that space at all. Most of them are very low productivity, bottom of the chain, survivalist activities, and are at the moment not in a position to act as uh, job givers. Um, and uh, so, uh, and I've also looked at earnings gaps between Dalit businesses and non-Dalit businesses and documented the discriminatory part of the earnings gaps. Discrimination that comes from sources that Professor Thorat was talking about earlier. It could be credit market discrimination, it could be land market discrimination, it could be consumer discrimination. All of these act uh, uh, to, um, to uh, uh, explain a part of the wage earnings gap between Dalit businesses and non-Dalit businesses. Finally, I'll just take one extra minute to talk about a, a study uh, which is actually forthcoming in the uh, uh, next year in 2016, where we looked at uh, an experiment, we did an experiment on the internet looking at charitable giving uh, and whether uh, uh, these are internet using uh, English speaking urban Indians uh, and ask them to donate a f an amount, a small amount to, um, to individuals who were named versus to charities that work for certain Group. So we, we used Dalit names, upper caste names, Muslim names, and generic Indian names which people couldn't place. And with each of these we had counterparts for generic um, um, uh, charity. So as opposed to those individuals who were given Dalit names, there was half individuals who were giving, given uh, the option to, vote, to donate to a charity that would uh, donate to, um, to Dalits. And the effect that we wanted to test in this study was, uh, is, is, well, uh, is, is well known in the social psychology liter literature uh, as the statistical or identified victim effect, which is that individuals 
tend to donate more to identified individuals rather than statistical or generic causes. And we find that for all other caste groups, we actually find that individuals donated more to the named victim as opposed to the statistical charity, except for Dalits. They were willing to donate more to the Dalit charities, but when an individual Dalit was named, their donations fell. Okay? And so we have explanations in the paper about why that, me, why that might be, uh, but one of the explanations could be that very, very low-ranking individuals uh, are not seen as eligible for human sympathy, uh, and people are unwilling to help identified victims who are seen as responsible for their own situation. The point about this study being that um, caste consciousness, I believe, uh, is alive and thriving in contemporary India. It's not old, it's not dying, and it's not a hangover from the past, and uh, yes, there have been new opportunities due to globalization and liberalization, but I believe that upper castes have been disproportionately benefiting from these new opportunities. Uh, several uh, sections of the SCST and some OBC communities as Ashwini, well. Ashwini, I need you to wrap up. Uh, are deficient in basic skills needed to take advantage of the new opportunities. Um, and so caste continues to mediate economic outcomes and asserts its presence in society and politics uh, today. Thank you and apologies. Okay, thank you. Um, I'd like to now welcome um, Professor Barbara Harris-White. It's very exciting to be here today, and it's a great privilege to be on the podium. Um, I've been asked to talk about Dalits and Adivasis, even more in the shadows. Um, in the business economy, knowing that the business economy consists of 95% of firms with under five employees. This may surprise you if you read the business press in India or the business pages of the quality English press, which is all about the corporate sector. But India's economy is dominated by tiny firms, and it expands by multiplication of these firms rather than rags to riches, even though we can all find examples of rags to riches. And it may surprise you that between 1990 and 2005, the average number of employees in an Indian firm fell from 2.9 to 2.4. So that's what we're talking about when we talk about the Indian economy. Um, despite all the achievements that Professor Torat and Professor Deshpande talked about, um, and confident predictions not just from Professor Bete, but Prime Minister Nehru, um, Swedish economy, economist Gunnar Myrdal onwards, that either markets, um, the animal spirits, or the rationalities of states, or liberalization would liberate the economy from the archaic arrangements that we're talking about today. Still, Dalits and Adivasis occupy the lowest rungs and they have the poorest chances of social mobility, as Ashwini uh, just explained now. They have fewest choices and persistent stigma and they're mainly positioned as labor. Um, and here, is where they're mostly employed, in agriculture. You can see these well-nourished people at the bottom of the caste hierarchy in Tamil Nadu. And they work disproportionately in the waste economy, um, which is something that India is now choking in, but doesn't seem to see. And they work in sanitation work. Um, I did not take the picture on the bottom left. It comes from the internet but all the others I encountered in my fieldwork in February. And you can see the magnificent, modern, high-tech equipment that is used to clean the streets and ensure that the general waste, which includes human waste these days, although human uh, manual scavenging has been abolished, was abolished in the early 90s, still isn't completely abolished. What happens in little towns where only half the houses have septic tanks is that it joins the general solid waste and it has to be cleared up by the municipal sanitation workers. 
So they are disproportionately, but not completely, Dalit and uh, Adivasi. And here is an Irlu lady. Irlas in Tamanat have a particular culture. They're multiply evicted, they're permanently transient, and they live like this. And here they are. Very hard work. Uh, on, again, on the bottom left, that's um, 20 kilos of plastic, but very hard work before dawn. Um, and as you've already gathered from the way I'm describing their work as labor, we can see that class and caste and ethnicity and gender and places of origin and the informal practices of the state outside its own reach, which I haven't showed you in photos, are regulators of most of the Indian economy, including labor arrangements, and as Ashwini and Professor Torat just explained, and all the arrangements in non-labor markets, money markets, inputs, commodities, products, um, all are structured, even now, even in the 21st century, through caste and ethnicity. And as Ashwini said, it's not as though these archaic institutions um, are being easily dissolved. And it's not as though nothing is, happened, is happening either. It's both things are happening simultaneously. So I don't think social science, I don't think researchers have actually managed to theorize very satisfactorily the conditions under which contradictory processes occur more or less in the same place. How can it be that in some sectors, like the Bilai steel plant that Johnny Parry studies, that Brahmins and schedule caste people work on the same production line, and yet in the industrial estate providing spare, uh, components to that plant, there is a very strong caste occupational structure, and the same applies to the town where everybody goes to buy their food and their consumer goods aft afterwards. So the balance of forces between forces dissolving caste and forces reinforcing caste or resisting the dissolution of caste is always localized. It means it has huge implications for research. Um, we need more and more local understandings of what is going on. And generally, it's theorized what is going on is theorized as what is going on to labor. And I just want to follow up what Ashwini has um, so very well introduced to you um, by asking the question, how do they fare as owners of small businesses? And here they are. This is infectious medical waste. These slides come from Sarah Hodges, who did a brilliant study of bio trash in Chennai. Um, all work for Dalits. Here we are in fruit and vegetables, which Dalits can sell because they will be peeled or cooked. Their surfaces won't be contaminated, will be blocked by a process of transformation before people consume them. And you can see how squashed these um, Dalit stalls are against the sides of uh, permanent shops in a small town, again in Tamil Nadu. Squashed between the motorbikes and the bikes and the permanent shops. Um, this is in the Himalayas, just to show you that women can be traders too and that women in the Himalayas suffer no stigma from trading in liquor. So the relationship is not always one we might predict as outsiders. Um, Dalits disproportionately uh, uh, confined to uh, butchery and selling meat. And here is a tribal lady selling cheese from the back of her, her wonderful backpack. <laughs> And again, gunny bags, things which get dirty, are disproportionately low caste. Okay, so what we have done is um, taken a different perspective on something which you've already learned from the other two distinguished speakers about the unevenness of the incorporation of Dalits and Adivasis as owners of firms. And what we have done is map the regions of relative disadvantage and advantage. Um, in the incorporation of Dalits and Adivasis into the business economy. Business in scare quotes, because as I explained, these firms are very small. Um, we think of business as corporates these days, but I'm not talking about the corporate economy at all. Um, 
First maps are of, on the left, the distribution of um, scheduled caste population in, in the total population by districts. So you can see that scheduled castes are not evenly distributed over India. There's um, a disproportionate concentration in the north. In the maps that I'm going to show you, dark is more, okay, and light is less. So it's quite easy to understand. Very few in the northeast, for instance, which I want to park, and in Gujarat, because um, you will see the patterns that are going to emerge. Um, and if you come from India, do keep a lookout on your state of, or your family's state of origin, because the patterns are very specific. The balance of forces are local. On the right is the map of the percentage of scheduled caste enterprises in total enterprises that were mapped by the economic census uh, in 2005. So there's a difference between the proportion of Dalits, the only part of India where the proportion of Dalits in the population and in the population of firms is in Orissa and parts of West Bengal that are happily slightly brown. Otherwise, the proportion of Dalits in firms is less than the proportion of Dalits in the population. That's what those maps show. And here you have uh, instances of either high proportion or low proportion. And there again, uh, you, you see very clearly that the northern area and the southern area, which have a high proportion of Dalit, Dalit, uh, Dalits in the population, have a low proportion in uh, the business economy. And you see the northeast beginning to appear as a zone of liberation for Dalits who managed to get there. And as I said earlier, Orissa and West Bengal are roughly at par. Okay, we can ignore that. That's simply the formula. It's quite easy to understand. Um, we, what we did with that data on population and firms is we made a very simple indicator where the proportion of Dalit enterprises to total enterprises is divided by the proportion of Dalits in the population to the total population. And the merit of that indicator is its simplicity because one means roughly equal. Under one means discriminated against, if you like, disproportionately disadvantaged, and over one means disproportionately advantaged. Okay, come on. <laughs> so this is the, these are the patterns that are made. All enterprises end, end up in a, with a, a funny kind of shape, which I want you to keep in your minds because uh, the patterns are so different and yet the main pattern for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes is rather similar. Look at the northeast and the mountains. If you get there, you have a disproportionate advantage in trade, or at least you are able to set up in trade. Um, and really, I want, because time is at a premium, let's look at the, uh, the details on the bottom uh, row, because look at construction. There it's a kind of patchy, um, it's, it doesn't regionalize in the way that agriculture and non-agriculture themselves regionalize the zones of advantage in the north and zones of disadvantage, surprisingly, in the south of India. Construction has advantages, they, <laughs> you can say Dalits have advantages for construction or construction has advantages for Dalits all over India except perhaps in the deep south. But look at hotels and restaurants traditionally associated with Brahmins. Um, pretty much disadvantaged all over India except for the northeast. And again, finance and business, a huge disadvantage to Dalits except um, in, in the northeast. And we'll do the same with tribal people. There's a kind of big dumbbell, I don't mean it in a nasty way, but here, this, this is the pattern which harks back in a much more um, distinctive way to the pattern of distribution of uh, Dalit, Dalits in the population. Population of Adivasis is very strongly concentrated in central India. And the same is true with firms. So there's a much closer congruence of the absolute number of firms and the absolute number of, Dal of Adivasi people. Okay, so then when we start looking at that ratio I described where on these maps, dark is, is better. 
and uh, yellow, lighter yellows are worse, um, we find a very strange set of enduring patterns. And because it's closest to me, let me, look, let me show you here. What is going on in Gujarat, around Mumbai, and in Kerala and the foot of Tamil Nadu? Because you find these blotches coming out, whatever the sector of the economy is, that you're, you're trying to map. So construction, again, um, is much more evenly distributed and much more patchy. But hotels and restaurants, we have UP where actually there were very few tribal people, but a, a lot of tribal enterprise. What is going on? What is going on in the deep south and on the west coast? Um, so, that's my story really. Scheduled castes and scheduled tribes have been conflated in a lot of analysis, especially by the tribe of economists. But actually, very different processes of incorporation are going on. Between 1990 and 2005, the latest data, the disadvantage of scheduled castes seems to have intensified and spread, particularly in the South, which we don't really expect. And scheduled tribal advantage has spread and intensified from the East Coast and these coastal blotches inland, but from a very low base. And we've heard a lot about pro-poor growth, but nobody has ever told this story of pro-poor growth of tribal people in the non-farm economy. The incorporation of both Dalits and Adivasis makes several coherent but different regions and reservations don't seem to have much of an impact on those public services that we could map. So we tried to explain it through economics and through politics. So we tried to figure out whether there are associations between Dalits in business, quotes, and urbanization. Are towns liberating for Dalits? Um, education, does it require education? Where are Dalits have more education? Um, do they do better? Land holdings, are Dalit land holdings a springboard for investing in business? Um, the relative density of Dalit populations, do, do, does it matter for setting up in business? Um, I suppose we're proxying for social networks. Um, and then lastly, poverty, does that matter? And at the state level, none of these um, heroic attempts to try to explain the patterns um, of Dalit businesses really produced any significant results. Just two minutes, Barbara. I'll, I'll reach the end. So human development in the form of education had a different impact on Dalits and on Adivasis and lagged literacy among scheduled tribal people helped them to, seems to have helped them enter petty services. Okay, so we need to know much more about the relationship between agriculture and the chances for um, these groups in the non-farm economy. Politically, um, we looked at the regions that we found and we related them to a, an attempt to regionalize pro-poor politics in India. And what we found was that our regions and the regions of pro-poor politics don't match. They don't match. So something else is going on. And I think pro-poor politics is using data that doesn't discriminate for scheduled castes and scheduled tribes. And so the take-home message from that is that um, the incorporation, political incorporation, of scheduled castes and scheduled tribes is different, and it, doesn't, it isn't covered well by calling them, um, lumping them together and calling them pro-poor. Okay, so this is my final slide. I think research is urgently needed on Dalits and Adivasis as differentiated and as gendered, especially the question of whether the entry barriers to different sectors of the non-farm economy are either economic or social or both, and why there is such regional variation. And uh, because I work in the field and in microeconomics, um, clearly I feel that the work could start with looking at India block by block, looking at the rural non-farm economy, and also looking at the needs 
of business for Dalit human development? Will there be better chances of the sort that Ashwini was talking about if employers can recruit all the labour from their comfort zone, from their comfort, social comfort zone? So we have to look at the need for human development as well as the supply of human development. And then uh, we can use this uh, experience of mapping to um, derive lessons for institutional change. What is the opposition, the hostility, the enemies of um, Dalit ent entry into the business economy? I'll leave it there. Thank you. Thank you very much. And finally, moving on to our last speaker, Dr. Ramesh Nathan. Thank you. <laughs> Jai Beam. Jai Beam. Friends, uh, first and foremost, I would like to appreciate all the organizers for having organized this. A conference addressing the caste and caste-based uh, issues because the issue of caste it is not only the issue of India it has become a global issue the caste caste-based discrimination has been witnessed in almost all the Asian countries in many part of the global and there has been a larger context and the international communities have a major role to play uh, towards alienation of this caste, as our Ambedkar, Dr. Ambedkar said. Uh, let me uh, uh, start with a positive note that based on our last 15 years experience, monitoring of Dalit human rights, particularly the atrocities against Dalit and Adivasi communities, trying to access the criminal justice system for the victims and survivors. And this experience from the ground level has been culminated as national coalition for strengthening of scheduled cause, scheduled type prevention of atrocities act, which is the progressive welfare act. And that is the only act which protects the rights of Dalit and Adivasis. And with all, with all our collective effort and this Act through amendments, it has been recently passed in the Lok Sabha, that is lower house of the parliament, and had to be passed in the Raj Sabha, in the upper house of the parliament. I take these opportunities to all those who have been supported this campaign last six years, uh, particularly Christian Aid, Bread for the World, the uh, Dalit uh, Saldati Network, DSN UK, IDSN, many others. This is one of the uh, major effort in order to strengthen your policies uh, in addressing these issues. Uh, this is the, uh, I mean, my presentation focus on the changing nature and context of atrocities on Dalits and need for re of solidarity. The detailed paper has been distributed, I think. Uh, let me try to summarize through some of the slides which focus on mainly the newer forms of atrocities and also the need for re-strategizing. And uh, as the, my previous speakers uh, mentioned that the Indian Constitution 1950, Article 17 is prohibits the untouchability practice and uh, practice of any forms which is a punishable offense. And similarly, the uh, Scheduled Cast, Scheduled Tribe Prevention of Atrocities Act, 1899, which also prevents the atrocities. But despite uh, more than 150 forms of untouchabilities have been practiced, obviously, in the rural area and very shuttle form in the urban areas. And various uh, forms of uh, atrocities are committed against the Dalits. Over the last 15 years, there has been uh, increase the, the atrocities or the crime against uh, Dalit communities, which has been rampant in the recent past. It is mainly partly that we consider due to 
the increase of uh, assertion among the Dalit communities, the claiming the rights of uh, Dalits, empowerment, and resisting against injustice. So due to this, there has been various forms of atrocities are rampant in the recent past. And if you look at the statistics of the National Crime Bureau record from 2001 to 2012, you can see 370,234 crimes are committed against the list, uh, of which 15,917 uh, the issues or the atrocities related to rape against the Dalit women, and uh, so many uh, Dalits were murdered, 7,900. 7, 49,514 Dalits were brutally attacked, severely injured, and 1,59,692 other forms of uh, atrocities, that is mass atrocities, burning of uh, Dalit houses, and so on, uh, of which only 33 percentage of the cases are filed under the SEST Prevention of Atrocity Act, which means a lot of cases still not been reported. And if you look at the conviction rate during this period, which is less than 10 percent. And uh, uh, the Dalit women continue to face multiple forms of oppression. I think Asa is going to uh, uh, cover elaborately. But just give you a, a kind of picture, the various forms of uh, uh, atrocities are committed against Dalit women. And these are the forms of uh, atrocities you can see, uh, some of the pictures. Uh, <clears throat> the newer forms of uh, discrimination atrocities we have witnessed in the recent past. Number one is there has been systematic uh, discrimination, violence against Dalit children in the uh, educational institutions and discrimination higher education. We need to, uh, we need to admit that the uh, so far in our uh, monitoring of uh, Dalit human rights, we are not really focused on the educational institutions, excepting some of the issues where there has been discriminations in the higher educations. But if you look at the school education, there, are, there, is, there has been many forms of uh, discriminations are taking place, including internal marking, caste abuse, physical violence, sexual abuses inside, outside the education institutions. The number two is the discrimination atrocities against Dalit women. Similarly, <coughs> there has been rampant on various uh, contexts. And also, the Dalit women have been murdered on the pretext of the practicing witchcrafts. This is also one of the newer forms that uh, recently we have witnessed. Then, as many of the, uh, my previous uh, panelists uh, mentioned about the discrimination market, we are nowhere in the market, still we are in the periphery, peripheral levels. But still we have been forced to do all traditional degrading, polluting occupations and uh, no access for the fair prices uh, shops also in the villages. Uh, there has been many discriminations, forced labor in the textile industries, forced labor in the uh, rural based industries like uh, brick lane, rice mills and so many things and also in the sanitary workers. In the, in, the, in the municipalities and corporations. And still the reservation policies have been denied in the private sector. It has been very well addressed already. And the mass violence are taking place in order to weaken the economic conditions of Dalis. This is one of the recent past previously witnessed the individual attack, individual murder, individual cases. But recent past, there has been mass attack on uh, Dalit communities because the people who have been, over the period of time, who have built uh, some of the asset being completely burnt and looted by the non-Dalits in order to weaken the economic status so as to they will go back to the zero, 10 years, 20 years back and whatever the money hard earned and been completely uh, destroyed by the uh, uh, non-Dalit communities. Then denial of state resources for the development of Dalits. There has been many schemes, many uh, uh, resources being allocated, particularly the, the scheduled cost subplan, the grant that have been allocated based on the population. It's all in the paper and mostly 
it is not been properly allocated and it not been properly implemented. Almost all those summons have been spent for the uh, common development of the people. It, it is not going to the, uh, the uh, economic development or infrastructure development of the Dalit communities. Then discrimi uh, discrimination, the distribution of wages under the uh, what do you call Employment Guarantees Act. This has been imp implemented, but there has been very systematic exclusion, discrimination in terms of uh, wages and, and uh, distribution of wages. The honor killing, I mean, I don't call it as honor killing, it is caste pride uh, killing, but uh, for many people they use this term, but there has been in the recent past due to intercaste marriages, uh, the Dalits are within the caste, uh, the, the, the young uh, women or young boys have been killed uh, due to the caste pride. Then denial of uh, basic natural resources, which is are in the villages, it's very systematic exclusions. Violence and discrimination in the local government. In the local government during the 1994 through the constitutional amendments, the Dalits, Adivasis, women in general got the uh, reservation uh, of uh, political representation in the local government. But there has been uh, various forms of discrimination, exclusion, and violence against uh, Dalits, Adivasis, women. And uh, they have not been allowed to uh, execute the, the, the constitutional power in the local self-government. Friends, the very important aspect that I would like to mention here, the entire uh, discourse of the human rights and the, the atrocities, now, I mean, we, we could say, see that the nexus uh, between the perpetrators, political parties, judiciary and uh, executives, that is government, which is really a dangerous trend that in, in order to delivering the, the justice system. And in every cases, every aspects, in our experience, finally when it goes to the trial in the special court, within the special court also we have witnessed this kind of nexus where the, the important critical cases have been acquitted in the special court. Some of the examples I'd like to quote here, that in 1997, uh, 58 Dalits people were being killed, including women and children by the private army called Renvid Sena. All those accused have been convicted in the Sessions Court. But uh, in 2013, October, all those accused have been uh, acquitted in, by the High Court. This not only one particular case, I can give you many cases, <coughs> this type of um, uh, uh, massacre killings, may, many of the cases which have been uh, convicted in the Sessions Court, but all those accused have been acquitted in the High Court. It is because of the political influence, because of the nexus, and I, I, I'd like to say that even within the judiciary there is a caste bias exists. I, I will give you a very, a very concrete example in the recent past in the same issues uh, where there is an uh, investigative uh, media called a Cobra Post. They have, they, have, uh, they have done it in investigations in the last three years, two years, and they have uh, uh, conducted interviews with all those accused, the commentators of the Ranveer Sena, the private armies, and the founder members and documented the video and recently they uh, uh, screened in the uh, press club of uh, uh, Delhi, which reveals alarming uh, information that in all those cases from 1994 in the state of Bihar till 1997, more than 3,000 people were systematically planned and killed of Dalits including women and children. The, the dangerous information that, that the, the accused, they confessed, is that the, many of the uh, leaders, political parties, that is Bharat Janata Party, which is ruling today, and uh, many of the leaders been financed and the training has been given, 
and uh, weapons have been uh, given from the defense and including former prime minister hans is there in the in the in the atrocities against the in the bigot state this is very very dangerous position that we could witness we know that there has been nexus in the village level in the court and uh, uh, in the special court but there is a state sponsored the parties are beginning and supported this kind of crimes and more than 3000 uh, dalits were killed in this uh, 1997 uh, incident all those accused were acquitted in the high court we are challenging this and this is becoming one of the evidence for us we already filed a private appeal in the supreme court and we are, we are uh, fighting with for the justice of the the dalits in the bigar state because after the uh, uh, the judgment in patna some of our activists have been visited the villages still uh, since 1997 even today the dalits are living in threats fear and uh, the rehabilitation not took place properly the boy who was 5 years old today has grown up is is roaming around with the bullets and women are under the threat and they asked that okay all those people are not guilty they have been acquitted in the high court that time uh, including uh, president of india kr narayanan he has made a statement that is a national shame but today these uh, people who have been surveyed in the village they are asking okay if you are, if they are not committed uh, guilty but tell us who has killed us so uh, <laughs> the government is not able to answer today like this uh, media who are being sympathized and support us they have been exposing who, who the people who have been killed those uh, dalits in state of bigar just two minutes ramesh yeah this is similar kinds of masker uh, uh, killings where uh, dalits have been uh, convicted in the sessions court i uh, i court has been acquitted because of the political influences but in contradictory we can say that the under indian penal court uh, the majority of the dalits who have been uh, convicted for the false charges this is i mean we can we can uh, also say that the death penalty uh, given to dalits when it's come 90% 94% when it compared to uh, non dalit communities which is totally contradiction to the uh, justice that we are seeking the uh, need for re-strategizing solidarity based on my experience let me uh, 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 share some of the our views that our approach also need to be changed in order to strengthening the surveyors as the change agent so instead of uh, addressing uh, making voice by individuals the surveyors need to be strengthened as a collective voice as a change agent for for uh, seeking of justice that includes women as as a, uh, the the surveyors of the dalit women as a change agent then the third aspect is the we have to uh, strengthen the policy reforms as i mentioned about the schedule caste schedule type prevention of atrocity sack also the increased uh, accountability of duty bearers institution mechanism need to be strengthened then the fourth is we have been providing legal aid legal support to all those uh, surveys of the caste atrocities but now we need to look at from legal aid to monitoring of the accountability of the criminal justice administration system itself including monitoring of the uh, court uh, court procedures and the intervening in the, into the court and uh, also we need to have a kind of shift from the first generation uh, right to second generation of right looking at the socio economic cultural rights which is also very very important to to uh, empower the community and uh, strengthen the public and private institutions in public and private institutions including education institutions we need to monitor and see that the uh, uh, zero discrimination violence Uh, prevails in in the institutions by enacting special legislations or guidelines into education institution then increasing the depth of evidence building that's very very important 
So far, we have been also uh, uh, doing, concentrating on this, but still we need to build in-depth evidences like uh, Gobra Post, how they brought out this, uh, the evidences. Similarly, we need to look at this aspect. Then focus on the downward swing and linkage uh, to the relevant global UN uh, international policies, which impacts at the national policies, like uh, the UN uh, principles and guidelines on the uh, elimination of all forms of uh, uh, work and descent-based uh, discrimination. Similarly, all the UN policies also need to be looked at, monitored, and impact at the national level. Then very important is strengthening the lateral linkages, uh, uh, south collaboration, uh, the shift from the north-south solidarity uh, support to south-south uh, uh, relationships, strengthening the Dalit movement, Dalit civil society's movement, and parliamentarian who are part of the policy, policy makers at this level. Okay, right so on. with this, I would like to thank <laughs> for these opportunities. Thank you very much. I'd just like to say a big thank you to all our speakers for almost sticking to time. Um, I would like to open up the floor um, now for questions, comments. I would ask that you do identify yourself, name and organization if relevant. Um, and also if your comments, then try and keep them brief and questions, please be precise. Um, so yes, the, the, oh, do we have a roving mic? Those two there, what about I don't know. Okay, go please please with a loud voice. Uh, so general disparities? So Mm -hmm. uh, within the Dalit group, there's also a lot of disparities okay. economically or socially yep. or Okay, I'll, I'll take a couple of questions and then I'll open up to the panel. Any other questions, comments? Um, Jean, please. Hi, my name is um, Jean Navid and I'm very interested in the trustee of Dalit Solidarity <laughs> in the UK, but I'm also a member of the European Parliament and I've shared the delegation there for relations But I wanted to first make the point that in, in terms of the relationships at the moment, I mean, people will not be surprised that the, given the sort of the power, the economic power, and the attractiveness of India increasingly for um, you know, countries within the European Union, I think you know, the, the issue about being able to raise questions about human rights and discrimination becomes quite difficult because people don't want to upset the Indian government. Um, which I think is pretty shameful, and particularly in terms of what you just mentioned about 94% of those on death row in India being dead. And at the moment, at the European level, there's a lot of concern about the reintroduction of the death penalty, for example, in Pakistan. So there are some opportunities there, I think, to make the point about how the rule of law is not working fairly for people from um, the Dalit community and indeed others. But I want to also ask a question about what more you think can be done by a business that's desperate to seek you know, investment and work within India in terms of actually enforcing, as it were, genuine anti-discrimination sort of practices. And given also the interest that we have at the moment in the global textile industry, not least because of our plant in London there, what opportunity does that give us? Thank you, Jean. There's a gentleman here. Yes, thank you so much. Um, 
in the morning and, and I wonder if, if, we, if we had had um, Adivasis included in, in, in the first keynote presentation whether other processes than market related processes would have been important such as overt state violence such as um, overt uh, um, uh, removal of people from, from, from the land in order to uh, make space for economic development of other sorts etc as well as, as police and, and armed uh, 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 an army atrocities against Adivasis. I, I think one should be careful to not to make uh, op oppression only to an issue of markets. Um, however, uh, regarding uh, Adivasis and, and the business economy, I, 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 I think it, it, it would be interesting to, to dwell on to what, to what extent the local business economy is pro-poor. I think Barbara has white set that, uh, that, that the local business economy was, was pro-poor for uh, um, Adivasis. Um, as far as I, I'm aware, figures published uh, by uh, the Labour Yearbook by the uh, Institute for Human Development, and then it's probably uh, NSS figures show that, that the business economy for Dalit and Adivasis uh, has, has a huge proportion of, 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 of very poor people within the business economy as opposed to uh, uh, when we're looking at, at OPCs and in particular a general caste which tends to be well off within the business economy. So is business is necessarily a way out of poverty for Dalit um, uh, and Ad Adivasis or is it as, uh, as, as another speaker said uh, uh, mainly um, survival uh, activities that takes place with, within the business economy? Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll come to you um, in the next round. There's, I'll take those three questions. Maybe that, that last question, um, Barbara, would you like to start? No? <laughs> okay. Um, Ashwini? Sure. Um, uh, yeah, I'll actually uh, say a line each of each of the questions. Okay. Yep, please, please. So the question of disparities within Dalits, I mean, in terms of uh, if you just look at data sources, we don't have data by Jati yet. So there can be uh, qualitative accounts, but if you, I mean, since I work with quantitative measures, uh, it's at the moment not possible to look at quantitatively uh, disparities within any, any of these large uh, categories. But yes, there are qualitative accounts that one can look at. Um, and on the question of what can be done uh, by business actually, um, I've actually written a small primer for the I, I, uh, IDSN, uh, which uh, talks about, uh, sorry for a bit of self-promotion here, but basically uh, the whole point is that um, there are several multinational companies that operate in India that, are, uh, that follow the principle of diversity in their home countries. For example, in the United States. So the United States, for example, has a... Uh, has a top 100 diversity companies, et cetera. And so the point that we are making in that primer is that if you can pay attention to workforce diversity in the countries of your origin, why not pay attention to workforce diversity in countries such as India? Uh, and that's really the simple thing. And so now when you look at um, the annual reports of many of these large companies, they talk about how diversity is actually good for business. And so the way to define the bottom line is not simply an old-fashioned way of looking at profits, but also the whole, you know, there are many, many arguments given in favor of diversity, one of them being that people from different social backgrounds uh, bring a variety of problem-solving skills uh, which are important for the success of businesses. So uh, those are the kinds of arguments we have made in that primer, and I think the way to uh, sell it is really uh, through emphasizing why diversity might be good for business. That's my personal view, which is that if you tell the businessman that, you know, you must pay attention to making a diverse workforce because it's good to reduce social inequalities in India, I don't think that's going to work. They'll say, well, we don't particularly care about that. We care about our profits. But if you say that diversity is good for you because your profits are going to go up, then maybe that might be a better way uh, for them to introduce. So that's um, as far as... And the final thing is about uh, the business data that at least I was referring to comes from 
two different sources, not from the National Sample Survey, which doesn't actually have earnings of the self-employed uh, in their data set. So I have the micro, small, uh, and medium enterprises data, the MSME data set, and a new data set that's now being used in India increasingly, which is called the India Human Development Survey, which has a module on uh, non-farm household businesses. And the MSME data set, which is a census of all uh, micro, small, and medium enterprises data sets. And so the conclusions that I was talking about are based upon that. And there, actually, in the papers, uh, we look at the scheduled castes and scheduled tribes separately, Dalits and Adivasi separately. So there are some similarities, some differences, but maybe I don't have the time to go into the details right now. I'm going to ask Barbara to respond and then Ramesh, but to keep it brief so we can get another <coughs> of questions. Okay. I'd like to uh, respond to all three aspects. Um, I, this year I've done some field work on the waste economy in a small town in northern Tamil Nadu. And so while Ashwini says rightly that the big databases don't discriminate, when you can actually talk to people, you can um, answer this question, um, which I can't do in under an hour, so that's that. But there are, in the waste economy, we could identify um, parayas, parayas, uh, and uh, a group that in some parts of Tamil Nadu are state schedule castes, but they're, they're called Arundhatiyas, they're migrants from Andhra. But in this part of Tamil Nadu, they've spent a lot of effort to try to relabel themselves. Relabeling is very important in escaping uh, stigma. Um, and they call themselves Katunayakas, and they have scheduled tribal status. And they form the bulk of the municipal, municipal sanitation labor force. And they work together at work, but they live very separately outside work. And together, they distinguish themselves from Irlas, who are tribes, scheduled tribal people from the forests, um, whom they refer to as animals, as not fully human. So, um, when we look at discrimination, we need to distinguish what's going on in the workplace, what's going on in the interface between work and the rest of society, and what's going on in reproductive sphere, by which I mean life outside work, the creation of the labor force of the next generation. And some discrimination takes the form of avoidance and of, um, of shunning. Um, Jean's question about business. Um, I, all I would say is that the Ministry of Sanitation, which I think comes under public works, um, has a lot of documents about technology upgrading, the dreadful system that the waste economy has at present, um, and the implications of everything that the government of India is producing on uh, what to do about waste is the massive displacement of labor. Is, is the replacement of this labor force, which is laboring under terrible conditions, some earning three to 5,000 rupees a month, municipal sanitation labor earning 15 to 25,000 rupees a month, um, to, to displace this labor altogether. And, and yet the waste economy is a massive great sponge for low caste people. And uh, Jens's last point, um, is, it, is business a way out for tribal people? Well, Ashwini has done this for scheduled castes rather than scheduled tribes, and the answer is no. Um, and there's a huge debate in India about self-employment. Is it entrepreneurial or is it disguised wage labor? Is it done under conditions of speculation and voluntarism or is it forced? And the answer is it's all these things. And again, we need to know specifically about locations. But where I was working in February, scheduled tribal people were in the food industry for their own customers, um, <laughs> septic tank voiding business, land rovers, taxiing, chauffeuring, and tour organizers. So they were able, th th this is the kind of thing that they, um, they rest their laurels on. These are the aspirational jobs for scheduled caste entrepreneurs. Thank you, Barbara Ramesh. Uh, <clears throat> there are two things I would like to respond. One is uh, John Dalton raised questions regarding the discrimination within the communities. Um, yes, there has been, you know very well, 
He has been working in Tamil Nadu addressing caste-based discrimination. Um, there has been uh, uh, many castes within the untouchable communities. Uh, there has been lots of disparities, um, atrocities uh, against uh, the Dalit communities uh, within the communities. Uh, because the caste uh, 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 issue has been such uh, complex and deep-rooted, and yes, there are in, in, invisible uh, communities uh, which are still under the un, under the uh, what do you call um, economically, socially, still they are weaker sections that need to be given uh, a special attention, special focus. And uh, with regard to death penalty, many countries, uh, they repealed or abolished this uh, capital punishment. <coughs> still in India, that uh, death penalty still exists. And there has been so many uh, campaigns which were also part of it uh, to, to abolish this capital punishment. But very easily, conveniently, uh, the people who have been executed uh, the death penalty are the Dalits and uh, uh, the Muslim communities. I think India still need to go a long way to bring reform in the uh, criminology, in the criminal justice system. So that is still a long struggle within the community. Thank you. Um, I had a few hands up for the second round. Um, Chikan, and then Eugene, and then the gentleman there with the green shirt. Thank you very much. I'm Shrikant Borkar from University of Sussex. I have two questions. Uh, first, for uh, experts of uh, South Asian society, uh, most of them are present here, to David especially, and Barbara as well. Being a student of anthropology, I've been observing, I've been to yesterday's this twin event as well. So the kind of anthropological gaze or the uh, psych uh, psychological clinical gaze I have been observing that it has always uh, been, and it is been, dominantly on the people, those who are out of the shadows. And what about reversing the same anthropological gaze towards those who are in the shadows? I mean to say, the perpetrator of the caste. So there has been less attention going on, uh, given on them, which I have been observing on. So what, uh, what is the reason and what, how we could uh, do with this? Uh, second question, uh, being an Ambedkar uh, activist, uh, my question is to the chair, Minaji. Yes. That recent, in the recent elections, uh, as I live in South Hall, and I myself witnessed that uh, the, the election among the British Indian voters, the main uh, issue which uh, this election was fought on was which government is going to support the caste, anti-caste discrimination legislation, and then, then we are going to vote them. So is this... Uh, this this uh, kind of the stigma or this uh, dirt from the Indian society, is it also taking its new form on international level? And as the uh, UK is a part of a European, uh, a European Union as well, and uh, the, uh, recently there was a, a much human cry on the part of uh, the as well. So what is your take and what uh, measures you are going to take on this? So these are my two questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Eugene? Yeah. You, are from you need to introduce yourself, please. Oh, my name is Eugene Kulas. I am coming from an organization called Voice of Dalit International. Because you are coming from a university, I would like to uh, draw your attention to 2013, when the UK government adopted the Equality Act with the caste provision. Mm. There was a big, uh, you know, um, lobbying from the university side, especially. Hindu scholars. Uh, he brought out an article, uh, a booklet on Hinduism and uh, said that the government policy is not uh, uh, at all suitable for UK. Uh, why that, you know, even if they don't say anything, it's okay. But why should uh, the progressive institutions like universities and professors with PhDs and things like that come out to support the obscurity? measures and going against equalities uh, you know, in, in this country. Uh, uh, can the uh, process be reversed 
Or why is the an absence of uh, you know, experts in caste discrimination? Because when we talk to anybody, they, they only speak about a fraction of the subject, but not the whole subject. And we have uh, you know, experts in uh, development uh, with no training in uh, caste discrimination and caste as the root cause of poverty and all. Can you explain uh, this little bit because you are from uh, the academia and you are known for the Dalit, taking up the Dalit cause? Thank you. Thank you. The gentleman in the green shirt at the back. I'm Stephen Bates and currently a research associate at SOAS. My question is to all three. Um, can you describe a little bit the relationship between Dalits and processes and patterns of rural and agricultural mechanization currently taking place? And the role of government uh, in then the direction of, in a sense, national choice of technique, which we used to be a central debate in the 60s and 70s, but now uh, doesn't seem to be on the agenda. Mm. Um, did you get that? Where is she? Mina Danda has a hand up. She had a hand up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there she is. Oh, thank you. Um, Right. Yes, so, all. <laughs> well, uh, thank you, Ashwini. <laughs> um, thank you so much for all of your presentations. They're very enlightening. I'll start with a question, taking a cue from what Barbara said about the contradictory forces that there are in uh, uh, both uh, challenging cars at some levels, but also reinforcing it in other ways. And, it's, uh, and you also said that the balance of forces is localized. So my question is to all three of you, if you take India not as a whole, but in terms of different states, one, where are the gaps in research? All of you have said we need evidential basis. You know, which states, you know, there are different states that people work on, and which states do we need more research on? That's one. I mean, there are many here who would want to maybe encourage themselves or their students. And the second is, from the existing record you have, even if it is global and from different indices, which state has, is so far the best model, you know, both in terms of conviction rates, uh, in terms of uh, having challenged caste, in terms of emerging forms of intercaste relations and so on in a positive way. So I, I want to know, I know the Gujarat model is no model. Okay, so I'm coming from <laughs> asking you where in your research, what have you found? Which state is it that one can look at for uh, something positive maybe? Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we'll um, just take those questions for a start. Maybe Ramesh, you want to start with talking about <coughs> reversing the gaze, bringing the perpetrators out of the shadows? There are a few things I'd like to uh, respond on is the uh, the modernization or uh, mechanization in the agriculture. In the recent past, after the globalization, uh, particularly the <clears throat> Employment Guarantee Act, in the rural area, the relationship between the landowner <clears throat> and the agriculture labor also being changed, is changing. Uh, the lack of labor uh, today we can see in the villages. Uh, the Dalits also migrate from the village, uh, from village to cities in order to uh, escape from the caste operations and they go for different occupations. So the feudal system within the village is also being changed where uh, there is inevitable that the mechanism have to be introduced in the village if at all the farming have to be continued. Also, the farming also being changed because of the uh, globalization. Nowadays, yeah, big companies are entering to farming productions in the large scale. So over the period of time, all the farmers are also going to be replaced. That is the kind of uh, trend or threat uh, are existing. Number two, in order to look at the uh, statistics, uh, which is best state or uh, less attached is state, but for me immediately it's very difficult because uh, there are uh, 22 states have been declared as atrocity prone states 
out of uh, 30 states, 22 districts, 22 states are declared as a uh, atrocity prone state by the government, which means 22 states are worst state. The rest, mostly uh, it is northern east states where the Dalits are very less population. And out of uh, 601 uh, districts in the country, uh, almost uh, 201 districts are declared as uh, atrocity prone uh, uh, districts. You can see in the website of the Ministry of Social Justice and Environment. So these are the worst state and districts. I'll ask the other two speakers to respond, but really very briefly, because I don't want to be responsible for putting the whole timetable out. <laughs> so I'm happy uh, to Barbara. Okay, can thanks. Just, yeah. Barbara? On the perpetrators, um, over several decades, I've been talking to businessmen, and businessmen tell me that Dalits have special talents for working in the hot sun, or doing hard work or doing dirty work oh. um, and I've also been told over the years fairly regularly since a horrible incident in 1973 that they're not fully human um, and so I feel that this question is a very good one to research why people feel that other human beings are not fully human and what it, what are they entitled to do as a result of that conviction. So I can't answer it, but it is a very, very important question. On um, the question about universities and prejudice, um, universities are sites for freedom of speech, and sometimes freedom of speech can be very, very controversial. There's a debate going on in Oxford about whether the current PM should be invited to Oxford. Um, and you can imagine um, the forces arranged for and against this. Um, but but we, the universities must harbour a range of, of views. And the role of the university is to examine these views and see what assumptions they're based on, what evidence they're based on, how um, robust they are. That's part of our job. And if there weren't people that some people in this audience consider to be bigots in universities, then it wouldn't be, the university sector wouldn't be doing their job. What we must do is examine the proposition, propositions um, put under the microscope and criticize them as well as we can. On the UK, um, and uh, because this question was quite a wide ranging question, I'm sorry. Um, it's, uh, the, the issue of discrimination against Dalits in the UK is really difficult to get the kind of evidence that an MP might want or might, might expect to have. Because firstly, where are Dalits in the UK? Secondly, um, how to find out um, in a global way what, what their experiences are of discrimination might be. Many Dalits will not come forward in the UK. I know this from a colleague who tried to do this work. They will not come forward. They are upwardly mobile. They want to deny um, things which actually do happen to them from day to day. So it's an extremely difficult issue to research. Um, Steve, the question about mechanization and agriculture. Well, you know better than anybody else that agriculture is being Dalitized and it's being age, aged. <laughs> the, the workers are aging because young men, educated men, are leaving agriculture in droves and it's becoming feminized. There's good statistical evidence to show all this. Um, but more to the point, I think your question is speaking to the new agricultural ag agenda in India, which rejects the kinds of farming systems research that you ha had contributed to so very importantly in the 70s and 80s, uh, where these issues of the relationship between machines and fossil fuel energy and livelihoods and human beings and their wage rates were very important. They are not important anymore. What the agricultural establishment in India is waiting for is a GM revolution. Yeah? 